start soon. Just a couple of more minutes, I think. Yes. Ruth, can I can I ask you a question about economics just very briefly? No. <laughs> no. Well, I just I just wonder if there's a thing called modern monetary theory. M -M yeah, I read about it. Yeah. Has it penetrated in Israel? Um, I think it reflects quite a bit of the approach that is um, taken place I think like in terms of uh, decision making but um, I, I, I can't say that it's theoretically penetrated as far as I understand but uh -huh. practically I think quite yeah quite oh, that's so. good. That's yeah. good. but we'll have to, to schedule another call about it All right. because we're going to scare everybody who came which we like not sure <laughs> Um, wow, it's so it's great to see everyone. Like, if yeah, more people can yeah. turn on their cameras, I think it's exciting. <laughs> Amal and Lucy, Gali, Anna, and oh, hey, alone, yeah. Ina. Oh. Yeah, Shana, I haven't seen you in years. <laughs> and, I know, and it's been forever. Wow, Lucy, look at this haircut. You look amazing. Who is brave enough to go get their haircut? <laughs> <laughs> well, she might have gotten two years ago. I haven't seen her in such a long time, so you know. I have no I have no haircut. curls. I have no curls left and my hair is all gray. That I'm gonna do by myself. <laughs> <laughs> We're all learning new talents. Everybody in this group is in Jerusalem? No. no. <laughs> Everyone are their home, in their homes. India, Mumbai. In Mumbai? <laughs> What's wrong with them? Ah, I have a, well, I had well, a meeting well, with well, Mumbai well, today. Well, I had a meeting well, in Mumbai well, with a guy well, named Oliver. Okay. I'm okay. Man Jordan. Shaya, I think you can... Uh, I think we will start, yes. Yeah. I'm a hundred so, uh, kilometers north of Mumbai in Palgar. <laughs> okay. Amazing. I'm going to put all of you on mute. I'm sorry, just to avoid the uh, background, okay. background uh, sound. So. Okay. So, hi everyone. And uh, it's very exciting to see all your faces in the square <laughs> from all over the world and all your uh, homes. So uh, good evening and morning, wherever you are. Uh, for those who don't know me yet, my name is uh, Shaya Bonstein, and I'm the Glocal Alumni Coordinator. I'm also an alumna myself from uh, the Glocal program. Uh, I'm very excited to start uh, the event. Um, as you may know, we, um, every year we are publishing a magazine, which is written by the local alumni, and we launch it in an event, usually a real-time event, so now we are doing it online. Uh, we use this opportunity to meet between us as well as to expand our networks and reflect on the topics discussed on the magazine itself. Uh, this year, this magazine is about cities and development and have very interesting articles our alumni wrote um, with diverse perspectives on this uh, huge subject. Um, you're very welcome to read it. The link, uh, I will post it now on the chat box and it will be published on the Facebook page and also it all, it's already on the local site. Um, and today in the event, uh, we will, uh, it will be in the light of the current crisis. We are all experiencing the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, we will focus on the challenges and possible opportunities we see in urban areas in development work. So I want to invite Dr. Reut Barak Wicks, the head of the Glocal program to say a few words. Um, Reut. Thank you, Shaya. Wow, it's really, really exciting to see all of you. Um, new faces and uh, veteran faces and uh, local alumni that I've known for many years and haven't seen for a while. So there are benefits to the Zoom. Um, I wanted to say that it's, uh, as I mentioned, we really like 
pride ourselves with, with having annual uh, magazine launches in person, but it's wonderful to have this opportunity to do it on Zoom and actually see people and involve people from around the world um, online. So for those of you who are new to the Glocal program, let me just explain what Glocal is. Uh, Glocal International Development is an MA program at the Faculty of Social Sciences at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. It's the only academic program in Israel which focuses on international development, and it does so from a very local community perspective. We believe that only by developing interventions that are relevant to local communities and owned by them will efforts to improve human development and minimize poverty bear fruit. The program is multidisciplinary, and we are very lucky to have academics and practitioners to study together with is and like to to teach the their different program uh, uh, courses. And the program allows international students to study together with Israelis and Palestinians, and to learn more about our region. The most unique aspect of the global program is a strong link between theory and practice and the four months internship students take with organizations which work directly with disadvantaged communities around the world. This evening, we're extremely excited to launch our annual magazine, which is written and edited by our alumni and students. This year, as Shaya mentioned, it focuses on cities and international development. With increasing levels of urbanization around the world, cities are characterized by both stressful environments on one hand and opportunities for development on the other. The magazine, which is available online, brings lessons learned in the context of urban development, both from Israel and around the world. We're very privileged to have with us today extremely experienced academics and professionals from the field who will share with us some of their perspectives on the way cities can be engines for development. Especially at this challenging age of the COVID-19 pandemic, we see how city governance and residents activism take the lead in many programs to support vulnerable population. Hopefully, we can employ positive measures to support such populations also in the future. I wish to thank all our distinguished speakers today, Professor Avner De Shali, distinguished academic and social activist whom I've been very lucky to work with when he headed the Global Program. Dr. Emily Silverman, who leads the study about urbanization at the Hebrew University and who has, generous, who has been generous to teach relevant topics to the Global students over the, few, over the last years. And our panelists, Ms. Mm -hmm. Sabrina Luzgarten, the country director of Hayas Ecuador, which is an organization Glocal started working with uh, through our internships. Dr. Anaya Bana from the Urban Clinic at the Hebrew University, who has vast experience working with Palestinian communities in the region. And last but not least, Jacob Stockman, a dear graduate of the Glocal program, who is the founder and director of the Gabriel Project Mumbai in India. I'd like to thank the writers of the magazine for not only being willing to share their views and knowledge, but also working closely with the magazine editors. A big thank you to the magazine editors, Shia Bonstein and Liel Magen, both local alumni who are part of the local staff. Well, Shia replaced Liel. And this event and magazine could not have been such an interesting, thought-provoking uh, part of our life without your continuous ongoing investment in the content and flow of the magazine. And a big thank you to Yali Azani for her work in preparing today's event, as well as the rest of the local staff. So for those of you who are interested in learning how to turn this world into a more just and equal place, we are still um, opening applications for next, next year, and you're welcome to contact us on this. So thanks everyone for everything and enjoy the event. Thank you, Reut. Um, so, now we will move on to our keynote speaker, Professor Avner De Shalit. Avner is a professor in the Department of Political Science and previously was the academic head of the Glocal program, as Ruth said. Um, and today he teaches the course of ethics and international organizations in the program. Um, so Avner, the screen is yours. Thank you. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Can you see this? Brilliant, okay. Um, so 
Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm really excited to, to, to see all the faces and um, ex-students and Alan and Dina, the very good friends. I might, maybe I'm missing another friend, but um, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's begin. So this is the topic of my talk and it's part of um, a research progress project which is in progress. So I should be very careful about what I'm saying. And you should be very careful about what I'm saying. And um, yeah, we could discuss the, the implications um, in the Q&A. It's a project that I've been doing with Jonathan Wall from Oxford. Um, we started uh, doing research about questions of inequality in cities about four years ago. Um, but in order to tell you about the project about the coronavirus, um, I have to, to say something about a previous work of ours, the book Disadvantage, which was published about nine years ago, and which is part of a family of works um, that were initiated and put for and, and promoted by Amartya Sen and Martin Nussbaum, who started the, um, uh, what is called the capability theory. Put in a nutshell, what they ask, uh, Sen and Nussbaum, is um, how should we compare people when we think about equality and inequality? And their main argument is that um, there's no point in looking at possessions, at what people possess, because somebody could have a lot of money but not be able to use it. So instead they suggest, and that's a revolutionary thought, that we should compare how well people function. Well, that's very easy to say. So they develop a huge theory in two or three books. And two of the main concepts that they use is functionings and capabilities. Functionings are the beings and doings that we want to be and do. So I want to be able to love, to be loved, to be clever, to be um, intelligent, to, to be amusing, to run, to be able to read books and so on. And capabilities are the tools or the opportunities that allow me or enable me to uh, reach these beings and doings. So for example, if uh, reading is uh, a functioning, literacy is a capability. Now what Wolf and I did, uh, we interviewed dozens of um, disadvantaged people in the UK and in Israel. And we came to the conclusion that it's not enough to talk about functionings and capabilities because in fact, when you think about disadvantaged people, part of the, of the problem is that they might have a functioning, but it is in a severe risk. So somebody could have a shelter, they, he, he or she um, could still live in a home, but they've just been made redundant at work and they might not be able to pay the fee, the, the, the rent, and therefore they, their shelter, their functioning of having a shelter is at risk. Some, somebody could be healthy, but their functioning of being healthy is at risk because their nutrition is not very good. So that's one thing we, we argue. And the second is that what we found is that disadvantaged people trade in functionings. So in order to make some functioning safer, uh, they risk or even sacrifice other functionings. To give you an example, if you look at uh, children of people below the uh, poverty line in Israel, they are twice as much likely uh, compared to uh, other children to develop uh, diabetes in very early age. And the reason is that their parents think about two functionings of, for their children. One, that they shouldn't be hungry, and the second, that they should be healthy. And they sacrifice health in order to prevent their children from being hungry. Okay, so bear this in mind. We'll come back to this with regard to the corona. So once the corona started, uh, Joe and I thought that this was a good opportunity to study inequalities in cities and our theory about disadvantage and to see whether disadvantaged people are more vulnerable to the virus than others. And we started by looking at Israel and in Israel we immediately noticed, I should say Israel and Palestine because we noticed two things there were two interesting facts. One is that in Israel, 70% of the infected people were ultra-Orthodox, so there was a group which was more vulnerable. And the second one was that there have been very few cases of deaths from coronaviruses among the Palestinians and apparently also among Israeli Palestinians. 
And the third thing that we noticed was that um, cities were much more vulnerable than rural areas. So we thought, okay, here we go. And we start looking at uh, vulnerable people in cities. And obviously you all know that the coronavirus is, a, is an urban illness and that the morbidity in cities is much higher. So if you, for example, you compare New York City and Chicago to the USA, and you compare the cases, the percentage of cases in the entire population and the percentage of deaths in the entire population, then New York has four times more cases than the USA, Chicago has three times more. And when it comes to death, it's even worse. New York has eight times more deaths per percentage of deaths in the entire population than the USA. And we thought, well, this uh, might have to do with uh, poverty. So, and the reason we thought so is that we looked at the Israeli cases and the two cities which had the highest percentage of, um, of uh, coronaviruses and also a huge percentage of deaths were Al Ad and Neibrak, two ultra orthodox cities, where the income per person is the lowest in Israel. Here you have the average in Israel, here you have Tel Aviv, this is Al Ad and Neibrak. However, when we started to look at uh, cases of poverty, we so that we noticed something very interesting. For example, if you look at the list of the poorest cities in the UK and the list of the poorest cities in the USA, and then you compare to the uh, cities or areas with most cases per capita in the UK and cities with most cases per capita in the USA, you may see that there's not a single city which appears on both lists. So none of these poorest city in the UK has the most cases per capita. And I should say that in, uh, about four or five weeks ago, Oxford was on the list of the having most cases per capita. Oxford is a very affluent and expensive uh, city. And Oldham, which is the poorest in, in the UK, comes only 17th when it comes to the number of cases per capita. In the USA, same, Princeton, a rather affluent city, appears on the list. New York City appears on the list and Detroit and Cleveland do not appear on the list. So we thought maybe the story is not comparing cities, but comparing neighborhoods or boroughs within a city. Okay, so we started to examine this. Here what you have are figures from, very recent figures from London. And these are some of the boroughs in London. Here you have the percentage of poverty in this borough, the confirmed cases, the percentage of morbidity, the number of deaths, and the, num and the percentage of deaths out of the entire number of the cases. So these are Tower Hamlets, Newham, and Hackney are the three poorest boroughs in, in uh, London. Then you have a few which are in the middle, and then you have Richmond, uh, the city of London, Richmond, and Pontains, and Brumley, which are the least poor in London. And you already see that Bromley is the least poor in London, but it has the highest percentage of cases and Tower Hamlets is the poorest and it has a very low percentage of cases and the same goes for deaths. And if you look at the graph, there is no correlation whatsoever between percentage of poverty and number of cases and between percentage of poverty and deaths. Still, the media was insistent that it was a story of poverty. So um, we thought that we should be a little bit more profound and look at uh, some cities where there is a lot of data. Now, New York, for example, supplies very good data. So New York has zip codes areas. And for each zip code, you have both the data about poverty, the percentage of poverty, and the data about ethnicity or race. If you want, I'll say something about the term race in a second. And the um, data about cases and percentage of deaths. So if you look at New York and you look at the zip codes and their median income, then you might come to, uh, to the conclusion that there is a beautiful correlation between the median income, the higher it is, 
uh, sorry, median income and uh, cases per 100,000 people. So the higher the median income is, the less likely you are to find cases of coronavirus. But I want to look, we wanted to look at poverty rather than median income. So this is the poverty line in New York. In New York, it, uh, in America, it is, it is defined absolutely rather than relatively. And this, uh, this is the percentage of poor people in New York, 19.5. Among the Afro-Americans, it is 19.2. And among the Ash Asians, it is 24%, okay? And what you have here is some of the zip codes, I couldn't put all of them because you wouldn't be able to, to notice anything. But on the X axis, you have a percentage of poverty in the zip code, the highest is 45. And on the Y axis, you have the number of cases per 1,000 1, people, okay? Now, what you can notice is that in zip codes where there is huge amount of poverty, you're likely to have a lot of illness. And in zip codes where there is very, very little poverty, 2% or 4%, you're likely to find very few cases. However, in the rest, there is no correlation whatever. This, this is the graph, okay? You can't find any correlation between poverty and number of cases. So we said, if it's not poverty, what is it? And we started to look at race. Now, I should say immediately before you slaughter me that race is a social construct, but we use it here as a description of the way people affiliate themselves to social groups. So people define themselves as Afro-Americans or Asian-Americans and or so on, or as Black British. And, um, and we looked at this data. And immediately what you, what you see is that if you compare non-white, the percentage of non-white white people in the zip code, okay, these are zip codes with 96% non-whites, and the percentage of, and the number of cases per 1,000, you see that there is a very good correlation. Moreover, if you look at some zip codes with bourgeois non-white people, okay? So there is very little poverty, but there is a lot of non-white people. You see that there are a lot of cases of coronavirus. So bourgeois Afro-Americans and bourgeois Asians and bourgeois um, uh, Hispanic people also are, are infected in high proportions. And if you look at the entire city of New York, well, if, and, and you look at ethnicities, Hispanic, Afro-Americans, white and Asians, and you compare their share in deaths and their share in the population, you get the ratio between their share in deaths and their share in the population. And you can see that the Hispanic and the Afro-Americans have more than one, which means that they die more than you would expect them if you looked only at their share in the population, and the white and Asians die less uh, than you would expect them. And if you age adjust it, you, you get the same picture. So what might explain such differences between ethnic groups? There might be genetic explanations, purely genetics or genetics combined with environmental issues and environmental issues could be social, economic, cultural reasons, or maybe racism. Okay, I will say very little about racism because in order for me to explain this by racism, I would have to assume that the entire population of New York, for example, is racist. And I don't think this is the case, but um, let me uh, say something about genetic and the environment. And our argument is that what explains this is a combination of genetic and environmental issues. And by arguing that it is genetic, we are not arguing that some groups are inferior. On the contrary, what we are arguing is that SOS urgently, they have to be told that they are more vulnerable to the virus. Okay. So um, again, could it do with uh, poverty? Um, as I said, Afro-Americans are more vulnerable uh, in New York. There are less in New York, but there are less poor both if you compare the medium household income or the percentage of poverty than the Hispanic, okay? Moreover, look at this um, picture, okay? Um, if you compare this area of New York, this is New York, this is the uh, um, 
map of uh, below poverty line uh, zip codes. And this is the map of the coronavirus virus, uh, uh, spread. The darker it is, the more cases you have. If you look at this area, you have a lot of coronavirus cases, very little poverty. If you look at Long Island, very little poverty, but a lot of corona cases. If you look at North Queens, not a lot of poverty, but a lot of cases, okay? So obviously there's no correlation between the two issues, okay. Race, however, can explain it if we look at Afro-Americans and also if we look at Hispanic, but also household size. So the more people there are who live in the household, the more coronavirus cases you would have. So this brings me to another issue, but I'll push this aside for a moment. I want to give you examples from other cities, especially from Milwaukee. 26% of, of the people of Milwaukee are Afro-Americans. 50% of the diagnosed people in Milwaukee are Afro-Americans. 82% of the deaths of, of, uh, from coronavirus in Milwaukee are Afro-Americans, three times their size in the population. Chicago, the same. In Chicago, what is, it's very interesting. If you look at the rate per 100,000 people of the cases, then the Latinos lead. But if you look at the cases of deaths, the Latinos do not die and the Afro-Americans die. And that's a question that really bothered us from the beginning. Not, not why is it that Afro-Americans have a higher percentage of morbidity, but why do they die disproportionately? This is how it would appear in, in, uh, in a graph. So these are the Latinos and these are the Afro-Americans. And this is true for other cities. This is Washington, D.C. One in 2,000 Afro-Americans has died, one in 4,300 Asians and Latino Americans, and one in 47 white Americans has died, okay? Huge difference. Is it the same in the United Kingdom? It took, I've, I've been showing this to colleagues for quite a long time and they all, in the beginning, they tried to say, shut up, don't say this, don't say this. Then they started saying, this is interesting. The first headline that I saw in the BBC was in June 9th. Maybe there were earlier ones. But look, if once you take account of age, most minority groups should have fewer deaths per capita than the white British majority because they have more children, right? So although they live disproportionately in areas such as London and Birmingham, which have more COVID-19 deaths, most minorities are also younger on average and therefore should have less, should be less vulnerable. But look at this. This is from the Institute of Fiscal Studies, late May. Um, uh, um, um, yeah, late May 2020, okay? So here you see that the actual, um, the actual number of deaths is much higher than what we would predict just, even if we adjust or after adjusting to age and location of the group, okay? So is it genetic? Now, some people argue that it might be genetic. For example, Anna Valls, from a professor from Nottingham says, look, we know that women are less vulnerable to the virus. So maybe we, know, we, we, we can realize that it is true about ethnic groups as well. But had it been so, we should have been able to see that this is across the globe everywhere. So what we examined, we examined the United States states. And in some states, indeed, the percentage of blacks among the deaths here in, in Brown were high, is higher than the percentage of deaths of uh, uh, Afro-Americans in the population. However, in some states, it is not the case, like Massachusetts, Arizona, Washington, Minnesota, and many other states, there is no higher rate of deaths among the Afro-Americans. So what is, what is the mystery? Where, where is it leading us to? I'll skip all this. And in order to understand what's going on, we assumed that our theory about disadvantage was right and that some people have to risk their functioning of health, not being infected in this case, more than other people do in order to secure other functionings. For example, putting bread on the table, having enough food, going, going to work and so on. So we started to look at 
all kinds of parameters which could explain this. So one obvious explanation is that not everybody has health insurance in America and compared to whites, Hispanic are almost three times as likely to be un uninsured and African Americans are almost twice as likely to be uninsured. But this is not enough because this doesn't explain why they die more. So we looked at other places. We looked at the type of employment. Now, bear in mind, the Afro-Americans are 12 to 13 percent of the population of the United States, but 25 percent of the Transport Security Administration uh, employment. So they meet a lot of people in places like this in airports. There are 27 percent of the bus drivers and there are 30 percent of the nurses. Okay, so obviously they meet a lot of ill people and are infected. And then what? Why do they die more? because 25% of the Afro-Americans live in intergenerational living, meaning grandparents, parents, and children together in the same flat. So the parents go to work or the children go to play with other children, and then they're infected. They don't die because they are young, but the grandparents are infected because they live in the same house and they can't uh, keep a social distance from their uh, relatives. There are many other explanations. For example, uh, that um, Afro-Americans use more often uh, public transportation on a daily basis. And of course, there were all these advices for passengers. For example, this one, um, you should keep two meters away from people where possible, but it is not possible. You should take off peak times uh, travels. But that's sacrificing the functioning, for example, of being a parent. So. If I am poor and I have to take um, the, the, the train to work, I have to leave very early in order to avoid the peak times. So I don't see my children in the morning. I come very late to avoid the peak time so I don't see my children at night. So I have to sacrifice the functioning of being a parent. I don't want to do it. So I, sac so I secure the functioning of being a parent and I sacrifice or risk my health. Sorry, oops, mistake. Sorry about that. Oh my God, what's this? Okay. Um, another explanation which we found in a very interesting uh, website article was that Afro-Americans are reluctant to wear a mask due to racial profile profiling by law enforcement. Uh, we don't know much about this yet, but we are going to check this. If this is true, then that's a very interesting social uh, explanation. But we also looked at other possible explanations, like, for example, is it the case the cities with more segregation are the cities where the Afro-Americans die more? So we thought that this might be the case because we saw that in Milwaukee, St. Louis, and New Orleans, and in Washington, there was a huge, a huge percentage of, um, of deaths among the Afro-Americans. And here what you have is um, in the blue, you have where this is Chicago, this is Washington DC, you have where the Afro-Americans live, right? So you see that these cities are pretty much segregated. I mean, they live in segregation. But this was not a good enough explanation because uh, we looked at the other side of the, of the map uh, in cities where there's very little segregation and there we couldn't find that uh, the percentage of deaths among the Americans was much, much lower. So that's only half an explanation. So in the remaining time, what I want to look at is issues that are more related to genetics, but could also be explained um, as a function of poverty. So we read and heard from some doctors um, who worked in hospitals with whom we consulted that about 30% of those dying of coronavirus had diabetes. So we examined who has diabetes in America. And this was really surprising. I didn't know this, but if you compare 
uh, adults in America who have diabetes and you compare non-Hispanic black with non-Hispanic white, the ratio is 1.5 for men and 1.7 for women. And if you compare deaths from diabetes, the ratio is even worse, 1.9 and 2.2. And if you compare illnesses that are related like kidney failure, the ratio is amazing, 3.5. But if you compare the cases, uh, this took me ages to find, but eventually I found it. The, the, who is treated for all these illnesses? Who goes to have a foot examination if, if, he, is, if he or she is suspected of being, uh, having diabetes or a retinal eye examination or influenza immunization? There, you, the ratio is less than one, meaning Afro-Americans, um, uh, are, are examined less than the um, white people. Going back to New York, we looked at three of the illnesses which are risk factors for corona, uh, corona deaths, asthma, disease of heart, and diabetes. And look at these figures. These are the white, Afro-Americans, Asian, Hispanic, in New York City between 2012 and 2014. I couldn't find later uh, data, more recent data, but these figures are just amazing. These gaps are huge. And remember that the Hispanic are poorer than the Afro-Americans. So poverty alone cannot explain this. Other social parameters have to explain this. Or genetics. Um, I'll skip this. Okay. Again, the last, the last thing that I want to show you is what we did with regard to um, obesity and overweight, because we interviewed a doctor who is the head of uh, the fourth largest hospital in Israel. And she initially said, we noticed a strong correlation between overweight and severe illness and death in cases of COVID-19. But then when we pushed her, she said, listen, I will say this very cautiously, but I will say this. All the people who died in my hospital were overweight. So overweight is a huge factor here. Now look at this. 80% of Afri African-American women are either overweight or obese. Non-Hispanic blacks were 1.3 times more likely to be obese compared to non-Hispanic whites. Uh, African-American women were 50% more likely to be obese than non-Hispanic whites. So that's a big issue, but that's not surely a genetic thing. This might have to do with poverty again. So I'm closing the circle and coming back to poverty. Why is it that poor people tend to be more overweight than non-poor? Because again, they want to secure the functioning of not being hungry and they trade with the functioning of health. So they eat food which is rich in carbohydrates pasta, bread, uh, rice, potatoes. And these uh, carbohydrates become sugars in, in their body. And therefore they have quite a lot of uh, diabetes. So the reasons that people are, and, and also therefore they become very fat or overweight. So the reason people in the African-Americans are overweight and obese could be a little bit genetic, but also combined with carbohydrate with eating uh, food that poor people eat. So I conclude by saying that um, disadvantaged people have to trade with functionings and this characterizes what's going on with the coronavirus. Um, I can take the car and not take the bus, they have to take the bus and so on and so forth. I also have to put in a word of caution. There are major holes in the data in the data, 48% um, of the cases of deaths are still have no race tied to them in the UK and the USA. So we have to be very careful. What can be done? I hope you accept that um, the cities are places of inequalities and places of coronavirus, but also places that have shown in the past a lot of solidarity and even revolution started in cities. So maybe there is hope. Thank you very much. Uh, I, and I'm sorry if I depressed you all. <laughs>
Thank you, Avner. It was very relevant, I think, also for the times we are in with the protests of the Black Lives Matter and uh, very relating to that. Yeah. Um, very insightful. Uh, if anyone have questions, this is a good time. We have a few minutes for that. Uh, and if people, if people don't ask me now, they can send me an email and I'll be more than happy to communicate. Thank you. Uh, we can share your email. Some questions uh, uh, being written in the chat. I don't know if you can see the chat. Yeah, oh, one question was uh, about your a paper about it. Did you publish anything in this about this research? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, we are so overwhelmed with what we see and every day we get more and more information. I must say it was very difficult to collect all this data because you have to compare different websites and, diff and you have to double check all, every website and so on. Um, so we haven't written a paper, but we are writing a paper these very days. So um, on Sunday, Joe and I are supposed to have a, a Zoom meeting and, and work on it, I hope. Um, and we are writing um, like a popular paper at the moment. But I can tell you, for example, that um, I lectured about it about a month, uh, six, weeks, six weeks ago. And uh, somebody told this to uh, the radio people and they phoned me to interview me. And once they started to get all the information, they said, no, 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 no way, we're not going to put this online on air. So people are afraid of these results because it might appear as if I'm blaming or as if I'm, I'm saying that the Afro-Americans are to be blamed for, for this. And, and what I'm trying to do is, is on the contrary. And also, you know, maybe, maybe there is something uh, genetic in, in the cases in Israel as well. We, I, amazingly, nobody has the information or nobody that I've been able to reach has the information in Israel about... Um, the rate of deaths in different ethnic groups. So what we know intuitively is that apparently um, the Palestinian people are less vulnerable to the virus than the Jews. But, but we don't know among the Jews, among ethnic groups and so on. So we don't know. There is also a question here about uh, the ages of those who died. Um, maybe I yeah. think you well, spoke about it, maybe you can... Uh, clear it again? Yeah, so m most of what I showed you was age adjusted. So, uh, uh, but of course, the ages of those who died, especially in Israel, they were very, very old. But, um, um, but all the information that I gave you was age adjusted and age controlled. So um, it wasn't a factor here. Um, there is a question why there is a lack of information uh, about the statistic in Israel? Do you have a, maybe a guess or an assumption? Uh, okay, so um, when it comes to people in the generation of uh, my children or my students, um, it's very difficult to track ethnicity. So, um, um, because they're very, very, my, my generation has a lot of mixed couples and therefore um, you don't know who is who when it comes to the generation of my children. But if you look at the people who died in Israel, it, it could have been very easy to, to track their ethnicity. I mean, by, when I say ethnicity, I don't mean Arabs and Jews. I mean, um, among the Jews, uh, whether they were uh, Western Jews or Oriental Jews. But for some reason, people didn't ask this question. They were not asked. They were not asked when they um, came to came to the hospital or something. Or at least I don't have it. Uh, maybe somebody has it. Uh, if if anybody knows somebody who has it, I'll be very happy to to get the information. Um, okay, we have a question here from Liel. Um, was there any comparison with other countries? Um, with other intergenerational housing culture in, in yeah. other places? So um, th this intergenerational housing is a very American uh, issue. 64 million people in America live in intergenerational flats, accommodation. So that's, that's a huge number. Um, and we don't have similar uh, data from other countries. 
Um, we are going to compare this to other countries um, eventually. <laughs> It takes a lot of time, you know. We started, we started like the third week of the coronavirus, and it's it's like every day, several hours to reach what I've just shown you. Um, so yeah, yeah. I I don't have data about Africa, and especially not about the southern part of Africa where everything is new now. I mean, it's going to be a big issue there where winter is coming there. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, I can't follow all the, I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah, no, I think um, Do you feel free to send me emails and I'll be more than happy to, to see the answer, okay? Yes. And um, so thank you everyone for your questions and for your participation. Um, we will move now for the panel of now. Thank you so much for sure. your lecture. It was very insightful. And, 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 Hi, everybody. It's so exciting <laughs> to see you all. <laughs> yes, it was very great. Um, so um, we will take maybe one minute if people want to refresh themselves from your uh, refreshments in the fridge <laughs> and uh, move to the panel. Um, and we will also hear Emily just posted a question in the chat. So this is a kind of a poll. We wanted to have your uh, response on it. So you can answer this question on the chat so we can get some uh, perspective on the, the people that are in and your experiencing of uh, the COVID in cities. Um, so in two minutes, I think, Emily, can we start? Uh, yeah, I think we can start, especially since we asked all the speakers to be incredibly brief and maybe we can have a little bit more time for yes. the speakers. So keep answering that question. Keep an eye on the chat. And as we keep going, I'm going to put in another couple of questions into the chat as polls for us to see what we're doing. Ooh, 25 answers by now. Great. So. I can uh, present you just to sure. those who are not uh, familiar with uh, Emily. So Emily is uh, Dr. Emily Silverman. Uh, she will be moderating uh, our panel. Uh, she's the founder director of the Urban Clinic in the Geography Department in the Hebrew University. And she teaches in GLOCAL, uh, the elective course of special justice and cities. Um, she is also very involved in activist groups and NGOs promoting public transportation and, and affordable housing and many other uh, issues. And there is a lot to say about Emily. So I think we'll uh, settle with that. And Thanks. Man. Thanks the and you... screen is yours. <laughs> okay. I'll stay with this just for a second. And you put that information. There's information about each of the panelists on Facebook under the Glocal site. There's a little profile of each person. And that was wonderful that you guys did that. When Shia and Yali told me that they were devoting the issue of the Glocal magazine to cities and development of Corona, I started telling them, I remember where I was walking during this conversation, all about the extraordinarily exciting work I was really privileged to be able to do with the city of Tel Aviv about how Corona was an opportunity for us. How Corona could be, oops, you have disabled participant sharing, Yali and Shaya, you need to re-enable my sharing, my screen share. Um, good that I was starting without it. And telling them about how within the city of Tel Aviv, we were viewing the opportunities from coronavirus. You know, if we are not using our cars during the lockdown phase, then we're walking more and we're discovering our neighborhoods and nature is becoming so much more important. And wouldn't it be great if, and the city said, yes, we wanna do this, we could work with the city to say, how do we make the decisions now that help us come out of this as a healthier city, as a city where people walk more and go to their local groceries for fruit and vegetables, because we're cooking more and where we are okay, not talking to our neighbors, but going out on our balconies and our roofs and on and on and on. And if I can now share the screen, um, this one, 
I wanted to do this one. This is what I want to start us with today, and I'm going to come back to the chat. Uh, coronavirus is not just fuel for urbanist fantasies. For those of us who see cities as the answer to a lot of the problems going on in the world, which has been a really dominant theme in my field. I teach in urban planning for a lot of years. Cities give us density, opportunity for economic development and for social contact and for innovation and for greater sustainability because our footprint is, our environmental footprint is lower. Cities are the answer. That's what we've been saying for the last 15 years. Coronavirus, I think, is challenged, not I think, coronavirus is challenging that in a number of ways. It may be true that for some cities and in some places like Tel Aviv or maybe, Bar maybe Paris, maybe Oakland, um, coronavirus can be used as an opportunity to close down streets that have traffic on them and open them for more bike paths and to take restaurants and put them out on the sidewalks and to have more outdoor activities. But that's not what's happening in an awful lot of places. So, oh, I can't see the chat while I'm doing the shared screen. Yes, I can. Um, if I look very quickly at what you have mostly written in your responses to this question, I see a lot of threes, fours, and fives. So I'm gonna ask that question again, I think, after we hear from the panelists. And these are our panelists for today and let's see what we think about it after. And a question too about being in the cities or being in rural areas. What does coronavirus tell us about cities? So we are gonna start with a presentation by Jacob Stockman. And as you can see, Jacob is the founding director of the Gabriel Project in Mumbai. He was in Glocal, an alumni from 2016. And Jacob, over to where is this going? One second. Give me a second here. Over to you. Okay. So uh, thank you, uh, Reut, Emily, Shaya, uh, Yali, for this opportunity. Uh, it's really nice to see some of my colleagues on the call. And thank you, Avner uh, Al Guru, for sharing his amazing research. Um, let's go to the first slide. Um, so again, my name is Jacob Stockman. I'm a proud alum of Glocal cohort number five. Uh, I live in Israel and I spend many months a year in India. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to have founded Gabriel Project Mumbai, which is a grassroots NGO providing innovative development initiatives for struggling communities in slums and villages in India. Now, second slide. Um, we concentrate on four elements of holistic development. These are four pillars that we hold being the key elements for a community, uh, for a community not just to survive, but to thrive. Um, so the, the four pillars are creative education, quality accessible healthcare, good nutrition, um, and these are three of the basic human rights that all communities should have, while economic empowerment is the tool to maintain these vital community components for the long term. Um, our almost entirely local team are from communities that we serve. Uh, and so we run innovative schools, medical clinics, safe drinking water projects, dental clinics, nutrition programs, and a women's economic empowerment collectives. Uh, and this we do uh, on a regular non-pandemic day. Uh, but with the lockdown and COVID-19, we needed to change everything while we stay true to our four pillars of community development. So, uh, third slide, as the coronavirus lockdown means no livelihood for millions, people who usually live hand to mouth are simply starving. We started an emergency nutrition program providing monthly food packages of, of vital grains, lentils, flour, oil, beans. This is based on the surveys of our local staff that take on a daily basis to make sure the most vulnerable receive the support that they need. Um, next slide. 
You don't want the education one? Uh, education, yes, please. Sorry. Um, yeah. Yes, all our schools, um, uh, including government schools and private schools, are closed by the government. So our teachers joined in the effort to spread awareness of COVID-19 through an awareness campaign, uh, giving of flyers, banners, posters, and simply speaking with their neighbors. Uh, and you can see the reach uh, they had uh, over the last few months during the lockdown. Next slide. A, a low resource community is just that. They, they lack what's necessary to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. We made efforts to provide tens of thousands of bars of soap, many donated by local corporations, face masks, hand sanitizer, as well as meals, that's dinner and lunches for doctors and nurses who are at the front lines of the, of the pandemic. Uh, we've also built three hand and foot washing stations outside hospitals as per the request of COVID-19 treatment hospitals in rural villages. Next slide. Uh, mm -hmm. When it comes to- Wait, I'm missing a slide. Hang on. Just talk, I'm missing a slide here. Okay. It'll, it'll be there. Keep, keep going, I have to go back and get it. Okay, it'll come up there. Uh, there are mm -hmm. pictures of, uh, of uh, our economic empowerment, uh, women in economic empowerment actually doing their work. So again, when it comes to economic empowerment, we need to synthesize the need to provide livelihood to our women's collectives and the community that we're, we're, uh, we're serving uh, and the needs of the community during COVID-19. So here I think we did something quite innovative. We pivoted uh, and took our sewing machines to the women's homes in the villages and slums and they stopped making shirts and bags and other items and started to make thousands of washable cloth face masks which we give to our beneficiaries, as well as to medical personnel and the police. And it's the same with our other women's collectives who now are producing soap to, you know, put, to supply uh, hospitals and, and uh, people in the, in the slums and villages. Uh, we help uh, a women's collective that does um, cooking is now distributing and organizing food packages. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, our women's collectives working to help their neighbors, their neighbors who are suffering under the lockdown. Um, so now it looks like that the lockdown and the effects of the pandemic will continue for many months and maybe even years. Uh, and we're looking forward to the end of the pandemic so that we can go back to making communities thrive and not just survive. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jacob. Uh, that is a very different look, um, maybe than what many of us are living with today. Have a look again at your response. How much has this affected my daily life? One to five, given that scale. And I want to now invite Sabrina um, to come and take us all the way around the world to Quito. And we will be right here. Okay. Thank you. thank you very much, Emily, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, for me, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I don't know if some of you know about Hayas. Hayas is the a Jewish a nonprofit NGO working for refugees around the world. Uh, we are I am the country director in Ecuador in Latin America. Next, please. So, as I said, is the is Hayas World Refugees is is an agency that works one hundred and forty years uh, in rescue the uh, Jewish refugees and, and and resettle them to the United States. But now we are working with non non Jewish refugees around the world and uh, uh, protecting them. We are working now in 16 countries, as you see here in this slide, 
I am I am here in Ecuador. <laughs> <laughs> at, the your, at the right of your screen, so we are in Latin America that we are facing facing a really really a difficult situation. I will explain in this slide. Thank you, thank you, Yali. So uh, now the issue that we are facing is the migration of the Venezuelan population. As you may know, the Venezuelan people is is really fleeing from their country because the lack of I have to say the lack of food, the lack of of the minimum basic needs. And uh, so we are facing this issue of, of the refugees in, 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 from Venezuela, but Ecuador, that is a small country of 18 million people in, in, in Latin America, we are receiving now, as, as you see, 363,000 Venezuelan refugees. And we used to have also still are coming Colombian refugees because of the conflict of the guerrilla. So I have to say that this small country has been with the open arms to refugees, I have to say, since the beginning, and, 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 and we are working very, very, very much with that. Please continue with the slide. So you, 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 may to, to, you may know now that really the situation for the refugees has been devastating. I have to say that for the refugees, especially for this population, that they have fled the situation of their country and now they are coming to Ecuador and to the Latin America in, in, to find a better, a better situation. Now with this, COVID, uh, with this COVID has impacted them very, very much. And we are facing, uh, they are facing challenge as loss of income, you know, the informal market in this population and in Latin America at whole is, is very high. And so they were selling in the cities, they were selling all in the informal market, and they really lost all of this income. So they became very back, they, they, been, they have stepped back in, the, in the, the situa of their situation in the country. We have a limited capacity of the, of the response of, of the government. This government they didn't have so much money to attend all of the population. So the NGOs are taking care of these populations, and this is a very, very important. We, they are facing evictions, a very, very high number of they were thrown out from their, from their homes uh, because they, don't, they cannot pay the rent. So the evictions are very high, and you see refugees living in the streets, and the NGOs are taking care of them in some point. Uh, the limited and uh, are not access to internet and especially in the education in the education piece has been very difficult because children they have not uh, like a computer they don't have internet access so this is also very very difficult for them the discrimination and xenophobia i have to say that when they go to the hospital sometimes they said no the refugees are not welcome here. So first is the Ecuadorians, then the refugees. And discrimination and xenophobia has been has been very very difficult uh, and have impact very very much. Um, that in the in the I have to say in the big cities. So I think this is a an, an topic in this in this conversation. And we are we see no the high protection risk for women alone. We have uh, a work for sex trafficking and all of this. So this is our, the, the most uh, uh, impact uh, that, that, we, that we saw. So what, as, as, as my colleague, uh, we, we really need to change our, our work of assistance. We, were, we, we have 16 offices in the country working face by face, and we need to change. We need to change to the remote assistance. And what it means, it means that we deliver, for example, the cash, because we work with, with a program that is called cash-based interventions in, in, in order to, to, fit, to fulfill their most urgent needs. And what we did is we make an agreement with the bank and say they go directly to the ATM to take out the money that they will need. So we need to mm -hmm. make a change. We create a mm -hmm. call so they can call us and uh, we see that in the small towns and in the rural areas the capacity of the refugees to access to hires has been very very good because the neighborhoods gave them the phone and all of these situations no so we create a call center we could now we arrive with this uh, remote assistance we arrive more or less to 14 families 
through the CBI, through the cash-based interventions, and also with food assistance to 15,000 families because we have a, a, a system, to, a, a system to, to go to the supermarket and the code, we give the code uh, in, through the telephone and with this smart. they go to the supermarket really to, 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 to have the food. We continue with our program of psychosocial support. We do psychosocial support, especially to victims of GBB, gender-based violence, and also to children. We work with the children through the camera. So we have like some, uh, we, we need to create. We need to create another ways to uh, deliver the services. And it is very important, the program, we have a very important program of economic inclusion. So what we are doing now is trying to make alliance with uh, online platform, marketing platforms, and to sell the, the products of the refugees in platforms. So Hayas is doing this, this work and also training the refugees. We are giving credits to the refugees. We are giving a, a credit for internet and for, for sale, for, for, for the calls. No? So we're giving money, so we're giving 10, 20, 000, $20 for, the ref, to the refugees so they can have credit for, for their calls. And uh, so we are trying to do all of this. Thank you, Emily. No, I'm finishing. Thank you very much. And uh, so this is a hundred percent of change in our intervention. Thank you, Emily. Okay, so if, uh, yeah, <laughs> that, and Avner, if you thought you were depressing us. Um, uh, on the other hand, there is the positive note of just, at least for me, it's being awed by the creativity of the response, the flexibility, the abilities to say, what do I need to do different now? And how am I going to get it done? And to hear what you're saying is just extraordinary. Um, we will move now back to this region of the world. And we will hear from a very wonderful colleague of mine. Uh, Dr. Anaya Banajarais, who works at the Arab Center for Alternative Planning and also at the Urban Clinic. Anaya? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, thank you, Emily and Chaya, for the invitation and for the opportunity to just present one of the uh, ongoing uh, situations that we are living in and trying to understand. So, uh, uh, okay, I present uh, the Arab Center for Alternative Planning. It's a non-governmental, non-profit organization, and it's ACAP. We call it ACAP, the Arab Center for Alternative Planning. It represents the needs and the interests of the Palestinians, Arabs in Israel, on the issues related to planning, land, housing, and development. And as, uh, as Emily mentioned, I'm a, a senior research fellow with the, with the Urban Clinic. Uh, and mainly I work with Emily uh, in many of the projects, mainly one of the, part of them is in East Jerusalem and uh, focusing in Palestinians, planners, uh, accompanying with Palestinian planners and uh, planning uh, criteria inside of West of Jerusalem. Um, uh, next please, Emily, it's in your, okay. Uh, when I'm talking about the Arab Center, um, it, it represents the uh, Palestinians, the Arab Palestinians inside of Israel. So it's very mainly the main issues that uh, we suffer from, or actually the main issues that we are uh, working in inside of the center. So we are talking about discrimination in land and resource allocation. This is the basic. And when I'm trying, I'm trying to describe the basic that the situation that we uh, had uh, uh, the deal with a new crisis, the, the COVID-19 uh, COVID or the crisis, the new crisis, that we are facing a new crisis while we are living a continuous a crisis in the issues of land and planning, discrimination in land and resources allocation, the unrecognized and uh, the unplanned neighborhoods, we are talking about 50,000 homes uh, that are not permitted or not legalized by the Israeli law, a centralized planning and plan system with lack of uh, um, sorry with lack of uh, presentation 
a representation of the Arab society. And of course, it's lack of recognition of the uh, 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 local uh, geopolitical and cultural uh, uh, cultural uh, aspects and of course between all of that the discrimination the, as a result of the discrimination discrimination the arab towns suffer from a lack of main infrastructure which is electricity wastewater i'm mentioning that as a basic for dealing with the new crisis with the covid 19. when the covid 19 uh, started when this situation all started it was a big damage for the Arab society. I'm talking about 75% uh, of the Palestinians inside of Israel that lives uh, separately in, in, ta in, in Arab towns, and about 5%, 80,000 uh, citizens are in the unrecognized villages in the Negev. Uh, so the centralized system, the government took the rule and made the decision, and she wanted to implement it inside of the a local a authorities, a local community without any a participation. A, of course, this could, a, a, the result was contradiction with the local needs and discrimination in the distribution. A, in many fields, when I'm talking about virus testing, no testing in the Arab community, Arab citizens had to travel far to get tested. Arab local authorities wanted to establish drive-through testing, but there were no public land available that would have fit the criteria for the healthy minister. So the health ministry. So eventually testing had to, do, to be done in the graveyards or in private parking lots in many of the uh, local municipalities. Uh, of course, we are talking about the, the situation was lack of trust between the Arab citizens and the government. You can see here in the picture a COVID-19 Ramadan campaign. We are talking about public campaign uh, by the Ministry of Health engaged with racial and cultural stereotypes about the Arab community that was rejected by the community members, making them less likely to follow the regulation. Um, and not, uh, of course, there is many aspects of language, uh, translation, bad translation or inappropriate translation. The financial damage that was done, the immediate financial response by the government to the local authorities, severely it neglects Arab local authorities. Um, all of the sub, from all of the financial supports, the Arabs get about 2.4%, where they are 20% of the local community. Of course, the lack, as I talked about, the lack, the lack of infrastructure, especially the electricity uh, and health, prevents access to education. We're talking about children that didn't have this access, and healthcare, like online doctors, whatever, it, it wasn't supplied or it, it wasn't uh, uh, done in, inside of the uh, local, local Arab uh, community. And of course, the lockdowns we had in Israel about 100 uh, meters from home, it's like open spaces in the Arab communities, and it's especially increased pressure and led to sharp increase in domestic violence, especially to women and girls. We saw the numbers that increased in this uh, area. So of course, the result was mainly the expansion of the virus inside of the Arab towns, so, towns. so this was a situation that must have intervened and must uh, have actual, uh, actual uh, active actions, actually. Next, please, uh, Melanie. Didn't move it, uh, Anaya, just because of this interesting image here. Did you want to uh, tell us what that is? Yeah, I, I just explained that we are talking about a stereotype. It, it's a a, a public campaign that was held by the Ministry of Health. It engaged racial and cultural stereotypes about the Arab community, as you can see here in the picture. And it was because of that, it was rejected by the community and it make it more difficult for the community to follow the regulation. Uh, and this was one of the aspects that made the situation worse. Um, I, of course, a cooperation or something that ha had to be done uh, and a, a success in immediate support for, a, for the Arab society. It was a fast cooperation between the nation 
National Committee of the Arab Mayors and NGOs in emergency response. They advocated and they had, they had also cooperation with the government and they established an emergency room for the Arab community. Uh, of course, there was, a, there was cooperation in actions and campaigns. You can see here in the picture, it's in Arabic, but it's a campaign that was designed and talked to the Arab local, uh, the Arab community in order to prevent such an expansion of the virus. And actually this worked, but the main thing that we worked on, it's the lack of success in dealing with strategical challenges like economic recovery or the, with the problems that was caused because of the um, injustice or the discrimination in land. So the COVID-19, it's increased, it shows us we, through the, this crisis, uh, the existing inequalities, it was more increased, the gap was a further gap, a, a fast, fast gap between uh, the Arab and the Jewish, but it increased the inequalities and the core problems of discrimination in resources and land allocation, and of course the lack of participation in decision making. There was no consideration that made the, for the continuation of the crisis, crisis or any future outbreak or in dealing with the long-term consequences of the pandemic or what happened next, especially the economic recovery and how can we close the gap. So actually what ACAP or the Arab Center for Alternative Planning are here in the, in the slide, you can see in the left side, it was initiation of the um, of the uh, ministry, not the ministry, of the planning administration, the Israeli planning administration, like from the other side, the Israeli planning administration initiated a strategical thinking about what can happen. Of course, they marginalized the Arab society. That's why we established a forum of a, a team forum of experts to, to discuss these uh, issues. Uh, next, please. And we want in these issues, in the main issues we just picked, the main issues that is related not only uh, to the immediate uh, immediate need or immediate uh, response, but also to uh, core problems and strategical problems. I'm here, uh, I will just mention some of the things or th some of the issues that we work on. We work on today and some of the things are in, in preparation. So it's improved the infrastructure, especially we are talking about electricity. Uh, in this period, we all understood what's the importance of homes, the, uh, all, of the, uh, the, all of the case of housing demolitions and demolitions or orders. We also have all the time monitor the government decisions regarding this uh, issue. Uh, uh, and try to advocate for change or to stop these uh, uh, regulations inside of the Arab towns. Uh, as I talked, as I said, about 50,000 50, homes are illegally uh, with no electricity and there were days uh, that we all had to stay at home but eventually we don't have we don't have we, we don't have we didn't have electricity inside of the big neighborhoods of course in the negev we are in the negev the situation is is worse because it's unrecognized it's peripherally it's rural we'll talk about that in the discussion but it's also a, a villages that are unrecognized in the arab uh, towns there were also uh, no electricity for several days because of this supply or uh, because of this situation. Uh, of course, we are, and we are talking about changes in the planning procedures, remote assistance for the local municipalities in order to, um, to keep monitoring the planning procedures and in order to give them the opportunity to, give need, to, to meet the needs for housing permits for the local municipality for the local community. Economic recovery on the local level, it's more strengthening urban local economies, which is like, it's, it's the basic, it's the platform that because of this situation, because of the discrimination and because of the gap that already exists, the crisis, many of the experts that we work with, they describe that we are already in crisis all the time. So. Uh, because of this uh, uh, injustice or uh, spe special injustice, the, uh, dealing with, it, with the new crisis made it worse and uh, make the gap 
the uh, more uh, between Arab and Jews. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Anaya. Wow. Okay. So with that set of background, enough slides. Um, there are a few questions that we talked about among the panelists in advance, but really looking at the chat as well for your questions. And there are a few important clarifications on the chat too. One of the things that we talked about a little bit in preparing for this is what's the role of NGOs? The GLOCO program really focuses on civic engagement and community development issues. And as someone who works in urban planning, where we are often focused on how do we mainstream our services? How do we get people into city government and national government so that we can make big scale changes? I often find myself asking, well, why just the NGOs? What about municipal government? What about national government? So I wanna ask the panelists who all showed us some, some important stuff from an NGO perspective, why through the NGOs? What's your role? What was government able to do and what were they not able to do? Uh, Jacob, maybe we start again with you, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Um, so I think in general, we who work in development, uh, we start off with an idea and we research that idea, we develop it, we create plans, logic models, surveys, we prepare questionnaires, um, and we do a lo whole lot of research and planning based on an idea that we think, with all our good intentions, is the best thing for the beneficiary community. But I think real development, and this is what we learned in the master's program at Glocal, uh, is working with the community members and local and national authorities whenever we can. Uh, so it's important to consult with local authorities, not to uh, just give our ideas, uh, but to hear what they are saying and uh, see how you can work with uh, the support of government bodies. Uh, we work with local leaders, community members, who are budding leaders in the community, village councils, they're called gram panchayats, uh, district authorities, and the state government. And, and an example, Emily, of an incredible impact you can have by working with the government uh, is in November uh, 2019, uh, we opened up an online grant facilitation center. Mm -hmm. um, what that means is, um, Initially, we had an idea to provide nutrition and health services in a low resource area. And after talking with everyone around, including local agricultural authorities, we decided to do something that we never did before. Um, you see, the national and state governments in India have literally hundreds of grants available for struggling farmers. Simple online grants for seeds, fertilizer, uh, for wells, for water containers, uh, rainwater harvesting, and it can all be applied for online with a very high percentage of, um, of acceptance. Uh, the government agricultural officer that we spoke to us complained that only 40% of all monies available as grants are utilized. And he complained, why are they not applying for the grants? But we investigated and because most of the people in the villages are illiterate, um, they've never seen a computer before. Um, and we found that many people were unaware of what was available to them and they don't have uh, computer access or don't understand the application language. So they simply don't apply. So we opened up an office right next to the district municipal uh, building. Computers, two, computers, two staff um, and great internet access, which is hard to do in a village uh, with a backup generator for electricity. And since November, we've generated over half a million dollars in grants for struggling farmers. Now, the government officials, they're extremely happy. The farmers are prospering and we're making communities thrive. But the main point is, the bottom line is that the NGO's aim should be in to fill the gaps where government agencies are weak. And uh, this is an example of what I think in the role of NGOs is is to fill the gaps 
and to uh, to help the, the, the um, beneficiaries with co collaborating with the government. Thanks. Uh, that's a story, Jacob, that since I heard that from you last week, I think I must have told it to 15 people. It's extraordinary. Although I then want to <laughs> say, how do you get government to set, to set up more centers like what you guys did so that it's not just what you're able to do in your place? How does that move to a lot of other places too? I, I, I'm not asking you that it's, now because I'm going to... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I will. No, no, sorry. It was an interesting question because... Um, they admitted, the government admitted that they didn't have the bandwidth to, to set up these kind of offices. Um, and uh, again, that, and they were upset because there are some pe uh, people in the communities who would charge these farmers like a month's salary to go and help them to do that. And so they would, all, the other reason why they, the farmers wouldn't come to, um, to apply. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, the government admitted that there, there's a lack, uh, that, that they don't have, the, and that's really a great thing because that's when government, when NGOs can come in and fill the gaps. Thanks. I'm going to ask a different question. Um, Sabrina, where is it better to be during this time? In a village? In a city? In something in between? Why can you can you compare those two? Uh, you're on mute. We can't hear you, Sabrina. You need to ch you need to. Unmute. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm okay. So it, it's 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 a very important question because in this part of the world, without a dot, a, I have to say, with this COVID situation has caused many more negative effects in the cities than in rural locations. A social fabric without within rural communities has proven to, more, to be more supportive and provide an effective support network for the most vulnerable members of the community. We have numbers from the government. We, we are not in now in this moment in each. We work in the cities and in the rural areas. And the numbers reflect that. Depending uh, only on their local resources, rural location uh, have not had major exposure to the spread risk. Additionally, uh, given the capacity of the rural communities for getting organized, taking into account the opinion of all the community members. Uh, they have come up with innovative local strategies for protecting themselves, such as avoiding visiting other, from other cities to get out from the, from the rural area to the cities and controlling the entry of persons from another cities, from other cities into their, lo to, to, into their locations. And, and, and this is, this is uh, very, very important. And we have report from the refugees also uh, that we know they live as we are in contact with them, so we know this is this is the situation. Uh, so maybe I have to say that the lessons learned during this pandemic in rural areas uh, may might reinforce the importance of uh, uh, promoting social cohesion uh, within cities and effective protection networks. And I think this has been. Uh, and we have seen that it has been a different ending. Uh, Anaya, do you want to maybe take that same question? What are you, you who have been working on cities and how do we make our cities work better for basically your whole professional career? What do you see from this as a challenge to cities, as opportunities? Or maybe we should be moving out of the cities. Maybe that's what we're learning. Yeah, I think that the situation that we are in made or actually increased many of the questions that it, it's challenged the whole debate regarding the cities, the development, the urbanism, uh, and how we actually increase the urbanism and the uh, uh, urbanism characteristics if we talk about density inside of the uh, 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 cities or, uh, uh, or less densities or any types of uh, living. But actually, Emily, I want to 
to uh, to answer the two questions because you asked the first one regarding the local municipal the local governance and the rule of government the rule of the NGOs and if I'm going to talk ab about the local context here in Israel actually in my presentation in the short presentation I talked about two uh, two places two main places the Negev which we have the unrecognized villages which had no local municipalities, no representatives, it's unrecognized. So that's why the NGOs or actually the whole uh, civil society have a very huge uh, rule in order not only to close the gap, actually to make, to, make the, to make the work, to implement even the implementation of a very initial uh, inf infrastructure or services inside of these unrecognized villages. And regarding the Arab local municipalities uh, inside of Israel, we are talking about poor, 90, more than 90% of the local municipalities are in a very low socioeconomic rush, ratio, it's very, it, it's in the low side. And they, they are poor, they don't have resources, many public resources, so they don't have the authority or the power and they lack authority, of course, because the system is very centralized. So all of the authority of planning and decision making, it's all in the center or it's in, in, in the national and district uh, levels and not in the, uh, in the local level. That's why the rule of, uh, of NGOs is very important. I think the, there is a lot of space to make it, to make more a intervention or more professional intervention for the for the uh, so, uh, social, civil society uh, but I think it has a very uh, important role in this situation of very huge gap between the government and uh, the local municipalities whether in in resources and in authorities and regarding okay, in the periphery okay I'll stop uh, no, I, I didn't mean to, to cut you off. I I was just thinking something that um, people who work in nonprofits are people who maybe are used to being very flexible, very adaptive to doing a lot with a little, to figuring out how you solve a problem. And maybe when you work sometimes in a big government infrastructure, you're used to more long-term planning, long-range, heavy processes, and maybe it's easier for some of the NGO people to organize quickly and figure out smart solutions like we're hearing here today. It's, uh, it's super inspiring. Uh, Shaya, you were going to ask Esther's question, or maybe even ask Esther to ask it herself. It's a great question, and we can yes. move from here. I'm just going to ask the panelists, think to yourself towards our last question is going to be to you in the final round, something you learned from someone else who presented, something you're taking from this. Panelists spend a lot of time preparing for this kind of Emily, thing and they're I, not, they're not, fish, they're not cooking. Yeah, of course. Go. I'm sorry. I just wanted to go and address that question also because I've been thinking about it a lot. The question um, about uh, cities versus um, a village. And I think the question is, ro is wrong in a way because um, vill both villages, rural life and cities, they fail consistently when it comes to vulnerable people, people in, uh, who are in poverty. So if there is a, a pandemic in a city, uh, millions of people are suffering and they're mostly vulnerable people. And the same thing that happens when there's drought or when there's uh, some sort of natural disaster in rural areas, um, that those areas are failing the most vulnerable people. They're, they have no cushioning. Uh, the most vulnerable people, uh, what we learned in Glocal, I think it was Avner who told us, um, that there are millions and millions of people who are on the, on the border, on, the, on the, um, the, 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 the poverty, extreme poverty uh, border. And anything that happens uh, in whether it's a city or whether it's in a rural area, anything that happens can push those millions of people either below the poverty line or above the poverty line. And that happens all the time with the most vulnerable people who are living in extreme poverty day to day. You know, in, in Mumbai, they live on a dollar ninety a day if they have a job. 
I mean, and so how can you have any cushioning when a pandemic happens like COVID-19 or if a drought happens, it's devastating. Anyway, that's my two cents about that. Uh, thanks, Jacob. Esther, do you want to ask your uh, question? Or I can ask it in your, for you? Yes, I'm happy to ask it. My question is about, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for the presentations. My question is about, um, um, to all the panelists working from the NGO funds, what do you feel are the biggest limitations of your work during this crisis? And also who and what do you think um, can fill that gap? Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to start with that one? Uh, it's on the chat, and the question is, what are the what are the biggest limitations that you face, and how do you think you can get over them? You know, basically bare your soul and then figure out how to clothe it in two minutes or less. Sabrina? So, uh, so maybe I can begin with that. I think the lack of resources in order to attend all of the population that now has has. I have to say they they get back so much. So the lack of resources is very important. And I have to say that in this part of the region, the resources are not coming. I have to say the Venezuelan and the Colombian and the in this hemisphere, we are not receiving the, as much as we really need. And as Emily said, very, very thoughtful, the, the, what she said is about what the NGOs has to do as as in, a, as in innovation, creative, in order to work with the limited resources, in order to attend a lot of people, filling the gap of what the government cannot do because of their lack of resources. Because these, these countries are very poor. They don't have capacity to attend their own, their own the, the Ecuadorians. So this is very, very important. I think it's a good question. And with this crisis, the people that was here, for example, refugees from five years ago, they came five years ago, and they were in good situation. Now they are coming back. Yeah. So the capacity of attending yeah. with the staff, I bought 500 phones in order to attend the, 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 the people. You know? so, all the capacity of the organization is, is coming, is coming in, a, in a very difficult situation. For, for us, it's very important what Glocal is doing, sending interns to our countries because mm -hmm. they support us. And they support mm -hmm. us as a staff, as a staff. Yeah. They are not yeah. in a way that, no. So this is maybe the main thing in this point. I will remember another one, but thank you for the question. <laughs> That's fantastic, Sabrina. And actually, uh, this year, I think the local interns are being asked to think about doing an internship locally because of the challenges of moving. So Jacob, I know you managed to do some of your stuff while being in Israel. And Anaya, obviously your stuff is in this area. You wanna address that question? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um... I want to continue from what Sabrina said. It's the lack of resources, it's one thing, but also the lack of, uh, uh, of knowledge of the real problems. Uh, actually what's happening at the end, uh, each organization, it, it, it works with a with specific community. And actually this is what I face all the time when I'm going to talk about crisis inside of the Arab community, uh, it's not, something that's inside of the debate uh, of the decision makers or people inside of the planning authorities or any any ministries so it's 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 also the local voice that must uh, uh, must be represented inside of the uh, of the round uh, beside the round of the people that 
uh, stand and uh, have the uh, or take the decision making. And actually, one of the things that we 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 do it's more working wider with professionals and with people and with people in the public uh, sphere and in the public offices, in the public services and in the private, in order to work more with them to make. Uh, uh, more changes. It's working in, in many circles. So actually, yes, uh, any resources or any uh, people, we work also with, with volunteers that really uh, um, uh, believe in the, in the message, in, in, the, in, the, in the issues that we work and in the big objectives. Uh, and we work with Jewish and Arabs. Uh, and it, it makes the whole difference to work together and to uh, create a difference. Yeah, I think Anaya, I, I'd, I'd point out something else if it's okay with you. I'm, I'm even if it's not okay with you. I'm going to keep talking. Uh, Noah Brandeis makes a comment here that she thinks NGO and government cooperation can provide governments with normative and flexibility working together. And Anaya, I think that's what you guys at ACAP really do. You're an intermediary. You're sitting there between government and the NGOs, government and the people, and you're saying, here's how you can talk with us. Here's what you need to do to do it better with us. I think that's a super important role and that there maybe aren't enough of those intermediary bodies that are mediating between the scale of the field, the scale of the user, and the scale of government. So thanks for letting me get on my soapbox for that one for a second. Um, you. Jacob, you wanna respond? I just wanted and we to are, go, we are um, drawing to a close here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just go wanted ahead. to go and expand on what Anaya was saying. Uh, and also Sabrina, uh, the, the idea of uh, not having enough resources uh, and not listening to um, local people uh, from our perspective in, uh, in India, the whole idea of the lockdown uh, benefits middle and upper class people um, or protects middle class and upper class people not necessarily protecting the most vulnerable. So uh, in, our, in our slums, uh, people can't social distance and they can't, uh, uh, they don't have money for uh, uh, be having hygiene uh, facilities. Um, and so the government's uh, decision to go ahead and, and have a lockdown in these areas, uh, frankly, just meant uh, a death sentence literally, okay, for people to starve to death because they have no livelihood anymore. Um, and so uh, when the, the, they, uh, the government or the authorities are not really understanding local uh, issues, like in case of Anaya was saying, um, then they make decisions that make our work much, much more difficult uh, and also makes, makes the, the people suffer on the ground. Um, so uh, I just want to agree with both Anaya and Sabrina on, on that point. Well, uh, I kind of want to ask anybody have any happy things to say, but I'm not sure that's really where we, where we want to be going with this one. I will share one of the comments there is, um, uh, I, I, somebody, I somebody's talking in the in the background. Uh, sure, go ahead. Who is that? Nancy, you are on mute. Um, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Nope. Is it working now? Yep. I, I think actually initially well, you talked about the opportunities here, here. and. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm kind of personally um, overwhelmed at the opportunities that I have now as a social worker who basically speaks only English in Israel. Um, I've been working in high tech for about five years as the VP of sales for a great digital company in, in the Kfar High Tech, right, at Hebrew University. But um, I've never really, I was a social worker before I got a degree or a second degree. You know, it's just who I am innately. And I'm very impressed with all the important things that I've learned today. And I think that when you spoke at the big, very beginning, you said, you know, there are a lot of opportunities here. And I've been doing a lot of chesed counseling. I haven't done counseling in, in years. 
but there are people who needed this that were stuck at home and couldn't afford it because they lost their jobs and they weren't even getting their unemployment yet. And this is happening worldwide. And I'm actually speaking to, I'm speaking to a group of software developers in Italy, in Turin, and I'm counseling the whole company for this whole thing. Um, and I feel like every mitzvah, every good deed that I do, it, it comes back to me. I feel like whenever, whenever we do something good, you know, it's just good karma, whether you're religious or not, or you believe in God or not. But I think it's very relevant to end on a high note on identifying the opportunities here and, and what, I don't know if it's God or Mother Nature has set upon us, um, this virus or this plague. Um, you know, we all have a lot of time to have thought about this before this meeting and we'll think about it for a long time into the future unfortunately, until there's an effective vaccine and beyond. But I think like we need to have more respect for older adults. These are the people who are most vulnerable in the community. Um, I think that we need to have um, a lot of uh, innovation in terms of reaching out to them in their homes. I ran ran a home care unit in, in New York for JASA, the Jewish Organization of uh, services for the age before I made Aliyah, and I, I ran a senior citizen center where we fed 150 uh, people every day, a kosher hotline. You know, I have a lot of experience with older adults, but I haven't done that in a long, long time. And it's, it's, I'm sorry to say, but it's exciting to me that I'm able to actually counsel people over the phone or on Zoom. And I think that all the NGOs have to also maybe hook into all the technology that's available here to unite people, the governments, with the people, with the needs. I mean, I'm not talking about the actual people okay. on the ground who don't have food or cl clean water, but, you know, there's so much networking that can be done here. And really, so thank, I, you. I, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I think that it does help to move towards optimism. Is there someone yeah. else who wants to talk about some other ways that we might be thinking about good outcomes coming from this. And you're right, I did talk at the beginning about, hey, we maybe will come to see the ability to walk and to see our neighborhood and the, the connection with nature more. Um, anyone else want to talk about that for a second? Anyone who's here? And we will, um, just looking. Imri, great, yeah. nice to Good. see you. Nice to see you all, I'm sorry I joined you late. Uh, and I've sort of missed a good part of the discussion. Um, but I, I just want to say that let's all be very conscious of the time issue here. The consequences, definitely the positive ones of the current, let's say, year is not something that we're going to necessarily see, uh, you know, when we say the epidemic is over or in Christmas uh, 2020. Um, the outcome of, of events like this are something that we're going to, you know, think about as a policy instrument. It's going to take years for the policy to come in place and years for it to actually impact us in terms of the way we use our environment, the ways we use our politics, uh, the way we reflect about our, our, um, our relation to work and our relation to each other. So what I would just caution is just let's be very, very um, sort of look at the long-term perspective. Um, and not sort of say tomorrow is going to be a bright new world. Tomorrow is not going to be a bright new world. Um, it's going to be pretty much the same as before. Uh, but let's Thank think you. of what's going to be the consequences in five years, in 10 years. Um, and will I, this be a blip? That's just my comment for that. Thanks. I guess one thing that's coming out really clearly in this is that some people have a lot of ways of benefiting from this while others are really short term tomorrow, not having enough food to live on because I used to sell stuff on the street to make my dollar 90 per day and where am I going with this? So I think it's important to be able to somehow keep in our minds these two conflicting ideas. Maybe now people will wake up to climate change and the need to deal with, but hey, there's people who are starving to that today and what, are, what can be done. There, it's, it's hard to encompass it all at once. Uh, yeah, Nancy is saying overwhelming. Um, yeah, yeah. 
uh, and the riots. Yep. Uh, Avner, do you want to chime in here towards the end? I feel um, humble and um, I feel nothing <laughs> compared to what these people do. I mean, uh, thank you for the three panelists. Um, yeah. It's really amazing and um, and really moving and um, I just admire what you what you guys do. Uh, oh, well, yeah, it, it's 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 odd to say I enjoyed this discussion very much because it was all so sad and depressing. But I think it it uh, gives us so much food for thought and um, and also a reason to be very proud of Glocal, I must say. I think that that was the best possible conclusion we could have <laughs> to this conversation. But yeah, absolutely. To be really proud of Glocal and to keep doing what, what we do for those of us who do it. Uh, Shaya Yali Raoult, thanks so much for the opportunity to do this. Um, shall we, back to you guys. If you want to okay. end. Yes, I think uh, we are right on time. Um, for closing this amazing event. Um, I really want to thank Emily for uh, moderating the panel and also to Sabrina, Jacob and, and Naya. It was really amazing to hear you and to prepare with you to this panel. Uh, we worked a lot on it and it was, uh, thank you so much for your time during all this crazy and overwhelming work. Yes. So uh, again, really, really appreciate it your time um, giving this uh, talk with us. Um, I think um, there is still some comments here, but I think uh, we can uh, read them and will the cities survive the pandemic, uh, Sydney? It's an interesting uh, question. Um, yeah, I think we're living in a really interesting, uh, disturbing time that uh, raises a lot of uh, questions about the future and about also the, this moment of life and how, what is the best way to live and uh, how we can support each other. Um, Annette, want to say something? Was a question when you for next month? Yeah, it's really interesting what Annette was saying. I think we, um, we mentioned yeah. it in the webinar we had on the public health uh, two months ago, I think, um, about how a lot of uh, aid workers and uh, in general foreign experts are leaving their communities and um, the communities kind of need to take a lead. Um, I think this is a very interesting uh, development that uh, will be interesting to see how it uh, happens because this is, I think, one of the goals of Glocal to uh, how we are involving more and more the community and um, waking everyone to be responsible and active for our own, uh, for each one, for their own uh, destiny and life. So um, thank you for that, Annette. This is a very interesting point for to look what happens with it. So um, thank you, Avner, also for your lecture. Um, and thank you, the whole Glocal team that helped me and support all this event. Uh, we did it all together. And um, if anyone wants to say a final word, uh, you are welcome. I'll just say um, thank you all for uh, being part of this. And uh, we really, um, we, aspire for participatory learning and I think that this was definitely a, a joint discussion and I'm really grateful for all of you who participated um, in the chat and in the conversation and not just the panelists and um, I, I think yeah I'm taking what Annette said and Chaya noticed like we really think that the power should be given to the people on the ground to deal with these challenges and I really think that this is something that we can all uh, see how important it is in times like this. So keep up the good work. Uh, 
continue networking to get more knowledge and resources. And uh, thanks everyone for participating. Have a good evening and uh, next year, hopefully we'll meet in person. But it's so amazing also to see all the alumni that I haven't seen in ages. So it's so nice to see you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good Thank evening. You. Bye-bye. Good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good evening. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Good night. 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 Good